Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And Carly Bird. Week 30, seven and a half months. Time's flying. I cannot believe, you know, I, I keep saying that, but wow. We're, we keep banging it out. Um, we keep finding stories that are really interesting. We're building a community like I never thought we would. And we just keep, we keep, we keep it the grind. And this has been a lot of fun. Yep. We have some really cool things planned coming up. Um, they're actually almost completed. Uh, we have the Patreon that we're still working through. Hopefully have that up by April. That's not easy. It's not no. easy business to set up. Like I thought it would be kind of like a click, click, bang, bang, all done, but mm -hmm. it's complicated guys yeah and then let us know in the comment section below what kind of stories going into the springtime what kind of spring ghost stories mm. spring cryptid or culture stories that you would like us to research yeah uh, we have some plans for our eighth month uh i got a really cool episode that will be in the works a little bit longer a little bit more in depth but that should be fun and i'm debating whether we should do it as a live stream or not that's the biggest thing but you know let us know in the comment section below like do you guys want us to do a live stream for our eighth month or do you guys just want us to do an episode or maybe we do both maybe we just do a q a and a little, little side one really fun to do a live stream mm -hmm. um especially for that one because i already know what it's going to be about yeah it's 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 a good one it's a juicy one especially for the area that hey, we for the in. area exactly that's what i was thinking if we could get you know some of our regulars to, to listen in um live and then comment i feel like that could be really fun that would be a lot of fun mm -hmm. oh also guys i completely forgot we are starting in april we will have a call-in show where we're gonna have a special guest talking about either paranormal things culture uh, certain historical sites, things that have to do with not only like the spirit and ghost stories, but kind of like that, that culture thing that we've been doing here, especially like if you look at like the Appalachian stories, which by the way, on our YouTube channel, our highest viewed episode ever was Appalachian witchcraft, wow. which is not just about a ghost story, but also about culture. And I think that's, I think where we're evolving a little bit. We're still doing the ghost stories, but based on what people have said, and what the data says, you guys like it when we delve into the cultures too, and like what created the story. Not just the spooky story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of, kind of agree with that, Bird. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. I'm really getting into this whole so, like research, the background, mm -hmm. and then talk about it and what what brought it about, and then talk about like a story that actually has that creature in it, which leads us into what I'm going to be talking about today. And one thing real quick, just to let you everybody know, uh, we will start drinking again in April. So oh, yeah. we have been doing extremely well. We're talking about our weight loss goals here. I am down five extra pounds since December. And I think the reason only five is because I've been gaining some muscles because uh, I've been going to the gym very consistently. Yeah, Carly, is there anything like about that? Because I know, uh, ooh, she has, she does have something. Any kind of health goals that you hit? Well, when we're speaking of weight, I am down zero pounds since november i've gained nothing but muscle and guess it's my body's balancing out woot woot so you can tell however <laughs> however i did reach a pr for my deadlifts which was 200 pounds i've never deadlifted 200 pounds before but this guy over here helped me create a plan and really inspired me to do it properly and not hurt myself and throw my back out when I go for it. And um, I'm gradually moving up and um, yeah, it was easy almost. I do love how she started with all the negatives before she got to it. She's moving 200 freaking pounds. She's only four feet tall. And I'm she's not. A <laughs> I'm five, I'm five four, Tom. And you lifted 200 pounds. And so it's like, oh, I'm fat. I'm not losing weight. Like, no, she's built like a tank. Yeah. She can beat up most children with how strong she is. So yeah, I love the positive end image. So point is like we are feeling a lot healthier. Getting a lot stronger. I can do pull-ups that aren't assisted anymore. And I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm getting stronger. Every single time I go in, I like pick up the same weight that I'd used before. And I'm like, this is easy. And then I just move up. Let us know. Do you guys like working out with your significant other or can it be annoying? That's a good question. I can feel like it can be both ways. Sometimes people oh, yeah. get distracted distracted and not like in the like in the moment get in the zone yeah. other people like they, they really enjoy it mm -hmm. so yeah let us know in, in the comments section uh or email us like do you have any stories of working out with your significant other where it's like you know i really want to kill them this is did, was not a bonding experience or okay. flip side like this was a great bonding experience to help this out and also let us know your like weight loss goals if you have them or just health goals in general right. you know i know we're spirits and ghost stories but then i thought like all right well for our liver and also like even alcohol companies do like the don't drink and drive commercials right. so i thought hey yeah we should do that like two months just go sober yeah. you know and then we can kind of get back into it right exactly i think that's great and i think that leads us into uh 
to this story, which I uh, cut you off with, and I apologize. So am I familiar with this creature? Yeah. I think it is a a samurai? A ninja? I mean, keep trying, because you're... you're A 10-year-old in a sick-ass cosplaying co- costume. Well, I think in reality, that's what is happening. It's is it someone a in a costume, but... Um, what you're looking at is an Oni of Japan. Hmm. Yes. That is really cool. I would have said, that looks like Darth Vader or like Hellboy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But um, in all reality, it is an ogre or a demon. Really? Yep. That's really cool. Yep. Like, how is that a demon or an ogre? Well. Um, or is it because of the culture? It's because of the culture. Okay. Ah, it's okay. It's Japan's ogre or demon, but depending on the myth behind it or whatever story they want to use to back it up, it's an ogre or a demon. But the habitat of this creature is hell or remote mountains, caves, islands, and abandoned fort uh, fortresses. Interesting. Yeah. That's really, okay, that's intense. So if it's an ogre, it's like a little bit taller than, right? Is, or is that just a weird like Western way of viewing it? Oh, it's large. It is large? Yes. That's really, really cool. Yes. So the diet is um, omnivorous, especially livestock, humans, and my my favorite, alcohol. <laughs> um, as- so he's livestock, humans, and alcohol. Yes. That is a, okay, wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and he knows how to dress too. Like, I mean, he is dressed to the nines. Right, right. He's all out, but I mean, culture. Appearance. The Oni are one of the greatest icons of Japanese folklore. They are large and scary, standing mm. taller than the tallest man, and sometimes taller than trees. They come in many varieties, but are most commonly depicted with red or blue skin, wild hair, two or more horns and fang-like tusks. Other variations exist in different colors and with different number of horns, eyes, fingers, or toes. They wear loincloths made of pelts and great beasts. All Oni possess extreme strength and constitution, and many of them are accomplished sorcerers. Hmm. They are ferocious demons, bringers of disaster, spreaders of disease, and punishers of the damned in hell. Really? Mm-hmm. So it's like a it's so is it like the gatekeeper of hell, so to speak? Gatekeeper? Because mm. I think in like different or, or or just a bringer of of, of death. It's just trying to find the symbolism because I know like in Greek culture, like there's a three headed dog that guards hell. Um, it's just so like where does that kind of fit in with that mythology? It seems more maybe not like a gatekeeper, but just a but like a bad omen, maybe. So we are gonna get to that. The behavior of the Oni are born when truly wicked humans die. Oh, and okay. And end up in one of the many Buddhists' hells. Transformed into the Oni, they become this ogreish and brutal servant of the great Lord Enma, ruler of hell. Wielding great iron clubs, they crush and destroy humans solely for enjoyment. And an Oni's job is to mete out horrible punishments such as peeling off skins, crushing bones, and rendering other torments too terrible to describe. All of these tortures are for wicked sinners, but only those not quite wicked enough to be reborn as the Oni themselves. Interesting. He is full of Oni. They make up all the armies, or hell, I'm sorry, hell is full of Oni. So they make up all the armies of the great generals of the underworld. So the soldiers of the underworld. Got yeah. it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's really cool. But also interesting to think, okay, there's two different kinds of Oni. So like one is born whenever a truly wicked person dies. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then others are transformed into the Oni. So that's interesting. So like Interesting. So, like, if a murderer dies, they become a soldier for hell. Yeah. If, if the basic version. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Damn. All right. That explains their intensity too. <laughs> like their their intensity. They're very masculine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. This kind of goes a little bit into more depth. It says occasionally, when a human is so utterly wicked that his soul is beyond any redemption, he transforms into an oni while he is still alive. 
He then remains on earth to terrorize the living. These transformed Oni are the ones most legends tell about and the ones who pose the most danger to humankind. Hmm. Interactions. Onis are the stuff of legends and fairy tales. Japanese mythology is full of countless stories of Oni encounters with lords and ladies, warriors and rogues. No two stories about Oni are exactly alike except for one thing. Oni are always the villains of mankind. The origin is originally all spirits, ghosts, monsters were known as Oni, which is like, okay, that's a really broad spectrum. Yeah. But the root of their name is a word meaning hidden or concealed. Hmm. And it was written with the Chinese character for ghost. In the old days of Japan, before the spirits were well cataloged, Oni could refer to almost any supernatural creature. Ghosts, obscure gods, large or scary yokai, even particularly vicious and brutal humans. As the centuries shaped the Japanese language, the definition we know for the various kinds of monsters gradually came into being. Female demons are not called onai, but are known by another name, kijo. Hmm. That is really interesting. Okay. So that's my definition of um, the demon. It's kind of it's kind of weird because it's like that's a we. I, I get like so. I guess they're a mili- they're they're very much a warrior culture, right? And this is me speculating. I am not a Japanese history buff. Neither or, of, so, neither am I. No. So yeah. So if there's anybody that would like to reach out to us to to basically inform us a little bit more, that'd be awesome. By the right. way, and do not judge my pronunciations of this tale. I'm about to read to you. It's gonna be weak. But honestly, it's like, why would you, if you do this as a culture, aren't you just hyping up being bad? If you can come out as a sick ass demon samurai, like if this was in Western culture, like you would totally hear about this if there's a high school shooting or a terrorist bombing. So like, I'm going to go back, come back as a power ranger. No, because think about it. This, this crushes any potential possibility of honor. Oh, okay. Dishonor. Yes. It's very dishonorable to become an Onai. Gotcha. Which means that, you know, if you become one, you're just doomed. Mm-hmm. And that you makes a lot of bring sense, actually. A lot of dishonor to your family. Because that makes it like so that's a big thing in actually like Japanese culture too. This is the part I do know because of military <laughs> history. Like that's why one reason in, in World War Two, you know, m- there is a I wanna how do I word this politically correct? They didn't surrender very much. They would rather commit suicide or die because of dishonor. Mm-hmm. It was dishonorable to surrender. Well, they probably didn't want to become and, an Onai. And 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 no, yeah, that too. <laughs> Sorry. But but the, I, <laughs> but that idea of like family and honor is like super powerful in, in you know a lot of cultures that are east compared to like the west. Like we don't have that anymore. I think like like they still do in the east. I mean, what do you think? <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Everybody's woke here and just... Oh, yeah, and not just woke. Like, you just need a body cam for everything because no one's going to believe you anymore. Correct. Or the idea of, like, making your parents proud. And there's still some of that, like, grains of that. But if you compare and contrast that to, like, the East, hands down, the East is way more ripe with the idea of, like, not disgracing your family's name. Right. Especially the, the I guess, who do you call it? The, the patriarch? Not the patriarch. Um, the head of the family? Mm-hmm. I guess whatever wording for that would be. Um, I need more coffee this morning. But yeah, like, so that makes sense. Like, you don't want to disgrace your father or, or your grandfather or, or your gods. Like, like, like Mulan. Yeah, yeah. Like Mulan. Like Mulan. Okay, sorry. Right. Got all excited. Okay. So um, back to my actual story. I have um, two short stories for you guys today. And I do apologize on the pronunciation. I'm really going to do my best. But some of these words are really long. And this is why she's doing it, not me. Because my God, that would have been a different episode. Oh, yeah. No, we would have to drink for that. This story itself is called Otek Maru. Otek Maru. All right, which means Great Mountain Peak. Hmm. It's a very well known and powerful Oni. So it's a name of an Oni, which is known to be malevolent and great and a great threat to humans. He supposedly lived in Suzuka Mountains on the border of the Isle and Omi provinces sometime between 781 and 806. 
very long time ago. During that time, he was known as one of the most powerful and fearsome Oni of all time. There were a few tales that revolve around Oteka Maru, but his battle with the Tamaramo stands out as the most well-known and interesting. The tale begins long ago when Otekmaru was a powerful oni who was known to terrorize travelers near the Suzuka Mountains area. Everything was fine until one day he stole items of importance to the emperor of Kyoto. This enraged the emperor, who then commanded his shogun, Saknao no Tamaramo, to annihilate Otekmaru. Hmm. Tamaramo raised an army of 30,000 horsemen and entered the Suzuka Mountains to accomplish this goal. When they reached the mountains, they were surprised by the sheer power of the Otekmaru, who used black magic to summon a great storm. The storm covered the mountain range and made it nearly impossible to see and battered the troops with nonstop rains and winds. Oh, wow. This went on for seven long years. Holy crap. Wherein the men barely survived and managed to keep searching, but never even managed to catch a glimpse of Otekmaru. That is dedication to be seven years when you think a wizard is yeah. just is just giving a wizard yeah. is giving you hell in o, like yeah a demon wizard samurai that is just and you're just attacking this mountain and yeah. like, at what point you're like okay it's over like, yeah just forget this and, and especially it's not like he's probably killing people too that's what's funny to me it's just the inconvenience thing of it like you're attacking right, this you guy can't hunt, and he just, so you can't so you can't eat so you die yeah. of starvation basically yeah yeah so everyone's getting frustrated you know you're bringing the storm it's constantly raining and sap it's cold yeah. it's wet yeah it's seven just, years of it it's just an interesting if i had all those powers maybe i'd like to try to set everyone on fire do yeah. that no i'm going to inconvenience the shit out of everybody's them. experiencing seasonal <laughs> depression because <laughs> <laughs> there's no like seven years that you're weighing this mountain like <laughs> dude you view all this power smite them or something Not like, i know just i'm gonna play the long game right <laughs> Right. It's not going to be a little wet. It's not going to be a little hot. But think about it. He is testing their honor. Like, he is ch he is forcing them to choose, am I going to be honorable or dishonorable, mm. basically. Like, what? what's your... What's your, what's your end game? You want to do this? Yeah. You play a law game? I'm patient. So while these years passed, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Otake Maru was busy in a more personal endeavor within the Suzuka Mountains. So he literally wasn't even around. He's just like, peace. According to the legends, a beautiful goddess named Suzuka Gozen lived in the mountains, and Otake Maru was bewildered by her beauty and was determined to somehow impress her. He supposedly transformed into many handsome forms, as, such as that of a noble human and more, and entered Suzuka Gozen's palace, but was denied by her every time. Coming back to Tokyo, Tamaramo, after seven years of being stuck in the mountains, he became frustrated and prayed to the gods and the Buddhas to help save him. The night after that, Tamaramo got a vision in his sleep of an old man saying to him, To, de de to defeat Otekamaru, you must gain the help of Suzuka Gozen, hmm. the goddess. After this, Tamaramo sent his army back to Kyoto and started back up the Suzuka Mountains by himself. After walking for some time, I bet the men were so fucking happy. I like, know we're going home. Ooh! Yes! <laughs> Thank God. He, what, what happened? What did you see? Nothing. Nothing. We didn't see shit. Rain. <laughs> Just rain. He came upon a grand palace, entering which he was greeted by a beautiful woman. She invited him inside, and he spent the night with her. After this, she told him that I came down from heaven to help you defeat the demon who haunts these mountains. I will capture him for you. Following this, Tamaramo realized that she must be Suzuka Gozen. Like, he didn't realize that originally, but now he does. Did he just fuck a dude? A woman. A oh. goddess. Okay, sorry. Actually, just... just fucked a goddess. Okay, got you, got you. I thought you said he like transformed into a chick. What? Yeah, I was no. not. Okay, cool. I was Pay like, attention. wow, that's a weird move to bang your enemy. Okay, got it. Continue. Pay attention. All right. Remember, he got a vision that a beautiful woman was going to save him. Gotcha, so he gotcha, set gotcha. out to go find that beautiful woman. Then he slept with her. And then she said, by the way, I came from heaven and I'm going to take care of this for you. All right. Suzuka Gozen then led Tamaramo through the mountains and showed him 
Otegmaru's Ote palace. She told him that Otegmaru could not be defeated as long as he was in possession of the San Mayo no Ken, mm. which is the three holy words of great power. After that, they curated a trap and waited for Otegmaru that night. As expected, Otegmaru came to visit her again to ask for her love, because he's obsessed with her, right? For the first time, Suzuka Gozen invited him inside and said, A warrior named Tamaramo is coming here to kill me. Please lend me the San Mayano Ken so I can defend myself. Bewildered by her beauty, Otegmaru gave her De Toren and Shoo hold on Shoto Ren to defend herself, but still kept the Ken Myreno for himself. Mm. Following this, the tide of the seven year battle began to change and finally things brightened for Tamaramo. He became began face to face with the Oni and started the fierce battle to end it all. The battle was nearly even, but through luck and some perseverance, he managed to overpower Otek Maru and defeat him. While the ending to this tale may, may seem anticlimactic, the point is that Otek Maru was such a powerful being that he managed to hold off an army of 30,000 horsemen with ease for many years. And they're also intelligent too, so not just brutes. Like the idea, like instead of just using just like physical force and violence, you know, being able to use those other his magic too like a sorcerer yeah. he was like a basically it's so funny how it, this one was a wizard you know what i mean yeah. like like with wand and whatnot but that's interesting like so they're not just now is it because he's just a more powerful one that he has these these wizard powers um i honestly think it just depends on like where the story took place gotcha 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 yeah that makes sense but um i have one more short tale this one's a little bit shorter Ooh. this one's called shuten doji Shuten Doji means little drunkard, which was the king of the Oni and a local tyrant from Mount Oyama, who reigned until he was slain by Minamoto no Yormitis. He was definitely a cut above the other Oni, as he was one of the three most evil yokai to exist. These three monsters are considered the greatest and evilest yokai in all of Japanese folklore. The ghost of Emperor Sotoku, the nine-tailed Kitsune, Tamamo no Mei, and the dreaded king of the Onai, Shuten Doji. So hmm. the three there that are the most... Um, I am evil. so glad you're reading this episode. We are not going to do any Asian culture episodes where I have to read it. No, like literally, <laughs> literally these words have like, you know, the little dots and lines. So, you know, if it's like a long O or a short O. And so like, I'm doing my best. For the people that have actually been longtime fans, first, God bless you for staying this long. So, <laughs> you know, like if you guys like know the Russian sleep experiment one and you've heard me just try to say normal words, it can sometimes be hard. <laughs> <laughs> Or he so. just completely pronounces it 100% wrong, like sleep would be pronounced. Plushete. Slepe. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't even notice. Okay. Um, back to the story. As with most, Shuten Doji was also not born an Oni. It is said that he was originally a human boy who was born over a thousand years ago, either in present-day Shiga or Toyama. Mm. He's, his tale is quite befitting of his name, Little Drunkard, as the night he turned into an oni, he was very drunk. That night, there was a festival at the temple, and in his drunk state, he decided to go there with mischievous thoughts in his mind. Shuten put an oni mask on and went around playing various pranks on his on many priests, such oh, no. as jumping out from the darkness to scare them. At the end of the night, when everyone had left, Shuten tried to take his mask off, but found he couldn't. It was at that point that he had somehow turned into an oni for life and ran from society to the nearby mountains. It was there he started to become an oni, stealing and ravaging and slowly building a crew of thieves and warriors. Oh, is that the end of the story? No. No, it's just like, I okay, so there's different levels of this. I like how one is probably like like a serial killing murderer. Yeah. And it's like, so you'll become one and like they're all down in hell. So like, what are you in here? I raped and pillaged. What'd you do? <laughs> I went boogity boogity boo. I went boo, priest. <laughs> 
I went boo to a priest. And it's like, like, I bet they all, all the other ones just laugh at him. It's like, oh, this piece of shit's down here. It's like, I got wasted. I got wasted. And I was like, I, I pulled my, I, I, dressed pull, up. I pulled my wiener out in front of a priest. And here I am. Yep. Just one bad day. <laughs> one bad day. One mistake. Well, many mistakes. Many one mistakes. Day. And then, yeah, here I am now. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. I guess uh, I'm bad now. <laughs> let's, let's learn how to be evil. I don't know. Over the years, Shuten Doji grew in power and knowledge. All right. So he did grow in power and knowledge. He studied strange dark magic and trained it to his thugs. Over time, Shuten and his group transformed into true Oni. At this point, they were a large clan of Oni and Yokai thugs who spread fear and danger to people in the surrounding areas. They slowly became tired of the same things and soon planned to conquer the capital and rule as emperor. Sometime after they began their conquest. Yes. Okay, no, that makes more sense. So it's honestly like, and maybe this just wasn't explained well in like, I guess their mythology. So it's like, you don't not, it's not that you just have to be like the baddest. Like if you're the baddest, you get perks to be one of these things. But if you're a little bad and you get turned, you'll slowly get worse. Yeah. So that's interesting. The story, not like you just remain like the guy just goes, boo. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not, that. that's not your life trajectory yet as a demon. Yeah. So once you get turned, you can almost like become worse and worse and worse. So that's interesting. It's, it's kind of like, um, Oh, what's a good example of that? I was thinking possession, but that's not quite right. Like drugs. Like, you know, you start smoking the weed and all of a sudden you're doing crack behind a dumpster. All right. Say no to drugs, kids. Dare program. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> anyway, after time, they began their conquest and Shuten Doji rampaged through Kyoto with his whole army of Oni. They went through while capturing noble virgins, drinking their blood and eating their organs raw. Oh, that is a step up from spooking a priest in the temple. That's <laughs> like what happened. I took two shots of sake, and then here we are. <laughs> Quite obviously, the emperor retaliated by arranging a band of heroes led by the legendary warrior Minamoto no Moritsu. Under a silent raid, they assaulted Shuten Joji's palace, and with the help of magical poison, they were mm. able to assault the yokai during a bout of hefty drinking. <laughs> so they captured them all while they were drunk, or like killed them all while they I were see drunk. see a through line here. <laughs> very fitting. Very fitting. Minamoto cut off the drunken Shuten Doji's head Jeez. with haste, but even after cutting it off, the head kept biting at the Minamoto and the other heroes. Because the head was of such a powerful Oni, it was buried outside the city and Onisaka mountain range. Good lord. The end. Punt that thing. In conclusion, this legend is definitely one of the most influential mm -hmm. and important of the Japanese mythology and folklore. The Oni are basically the common troll, but with a much more interesting and deep-rooted twist. Both of these tales of Shuten Doji and O. Take Maru were perfect examples of how much more these stories have compared to most common troll stories. O Take Maru can be seen to be such an amazingly powerful Oni who was able to easily hold off thousands of warriors at ease with barely any effort. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even present. <laughs> Shuten Dojo, Doji, on the other hand, was a normal drunk boy who turned into a king of many Oni and yokai and ravaged towns in his wake. I really that's really really cool because yeah i learned a lot about that like because it's not just so you know when i first saw the image and everything i had some you know preconceived notions of like, that's why i showed you the picture first. yeah i wanted like, you to kind of like get your little wheels turning it, it's it's like it's a devil soldier or it looks like like a demon but yeah. then you realize now it's a devil soldier the soldier of the, of the darkness but then it's how you get there like you can be like you can be like a vip if you're like really bad but then also if you're just like you mildly inconvenience people. You could become a low level grunt, but work your way up through the corporation and become bad too. So like, as soon as you become one, I love how I make all these analogies to corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> so future employers, I'm sorry, blah, blah. <laughs> but, but no, the, but, but yeah, that's interesting. Cause like, so from a cultural standpoint, you have these super powerful dudes that could be related to the soldiers of the time that, you know, you want to have honor yeah. because you don't want to become one of these. Mm -hmm. But also this can reflect to anybody. If you're a merchant, if you're a kid, hey, you know, if you jump out and spook a priest or if you don't mind your mom, right. you could become one of these things and slowly get more evil. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an interesting tie in that like, you know, it's not just one specific way you can become this. It's about, I think, keeping people in line. And mm -hmm. again, like you said, 
the culture of honor, mm -hmm. like keeping your honor intact. That's really cool, Carly. That's yeah. a good one. Thank you. But um, yeah, the guys, I think that's uh, it for today's show. We'll wrap it up. As we uh, kill our view duration here, as I tell you guys that we're done for the day. But please let us know in the comment section, how badly did we screw up these words? And I saw how I say like we together here because I'm probably just screwing up my English. But let us know <laughs> in the comment section, like, do you guys want us to do more stories like this? Do you have any experiences like, like with demons haunting you? Or yeah. do you like anime? Because I do. Dragon Ball Z. One Punch Man, all very good. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because oh, and we're watching. I know because we're killing her. But Arcane, <laughs> we haven't seen the like all of it. We're a couple episodes left. Arcane is fantastic, and it really does have that kind of like that anime feel to it. It does, and that's what kind of got me on this whole trip. Yeah, just like the 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 style. Mm -hmm. I like the style of it. Very vivid, very colorful. Mm -hmm. Nothing the to do. The storyline is also very. Um, detailed deep. yeah 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 i think that's what i was trying to get at just very detailed and um just there's a dark and then there's a there's a light kind of deal well, and that's what happens like when you build up your characters like i think having those first few episodes to give backstory and to grow it's so important and then when stuff happens everything makes sense mm -hmm. and i like how for this one character it's like do you think she's bipolar or do you think she's just having a mental breakdown but i like the effects they do with that to see what her brain's like mm -hmm. I like that staticky thing that's really cool. I don't know why that really hit me. Like that's a cool way to show somebody like yeah. like losing their mind. But she wasn't always like that. Right. And I like that that I don't know if degradation is the right word for this. You're kind of getting off track with these people that never watched Arcane. I if know. you like anime, you'll like Arcane, and that season is available on Netflix yes, for your as, viewing as we, pleasure. Yeah, we are not sponsored by them, but it just got me thinking about this. Okay. Um, but about honor. And I think that's the interesting thing about that ties into honor mm -hmm. was I think where I was going with that. But anyway, Carly, thank you. Week 30 is in the books. We'll see you guys next time on Spirits and Ghost Stories. Bye. Bye.